Hello ladies and gentlemen and welcome to Florence. Today is going to be a little bit different. So as that overly long and elaborated intro stated, Sandeep and I are going to the Museo dell'Opera del Duomo today. I hope you liked the slow-mo parts, we had a lot of fun shooting it. I've never gotten so many weird looks on the streets before. We started out traveling from our respective homes and met at the corner of Borgo Pinti and Via del Oriolo. And then we did the last leg together, serpentining through the tourists to get to the museum, which is located behind Santa Maria del Pio. The museum was redone and reopened two, three years ago, perhaps, and so it's state of the art. The museum occupies the space where the old Duomo workshop used to be, where they used to do work for, for the Duomo. And amongst other things, the David was carved in these workshops. The museum houses the original bronze doors for the baptistry by Ghiberti, but we are not here for that. We are here for something very special. The Bandini Pietà by Michelangelo Bonarotti. The sculpture has many names. The Deposition, the Lamentation over the Dead Christ, or the Florentine Pietà. The sculpture is carved from a single block of marble 
and stands 7 feet and 4 inches or 226 centimeters tall. And it's mounted on its dark stone days in a beautifully lit room in the museum. First, a bit of history before we go into the technicality of sculpture. The sculpture was supposedly bent to go on Michelangelo's tomb in Santa Maria Maggiore in Rome, but he never finished it and ended up attempting to destroy it and ultimately he sold it. Now there are many theories why he destroyed it, tried to destroy it. Some say the marble was flawed and so he couldn't finish it. Some say elements of the piece made Michelangelo uneasy, specifically the lost leg laying over the lap of Mary. Or that the inclusion of a self-portrait of himself as Nicodemus, which is the character in the back with the hood, would have outed him as a follower of Nicodemus, whose teaching were closely aligned with that of the newly formed Protestant church. The Italy of Michelangelo's time, and of today of course, is overwhelmingly Catholic, so this, could have, this is a potential theory. Michelangelo was also close with Vittoria Colonna, who was part of the, a group called the Spirituali, and they also followed, to a certain extent at least, the teaching of Nicodemus. And this was right at the time of the Reformation, and so you wanted to be careful with not aligning yourself fully with the Catholic Church, especially in Italy, and especially when you were working for the Pope. All of these are theories, of course, and there is no clear answers. Michelangelo, who was also a poet, did write this poem as he was making the sculpture. In such slavery and with so much boredom and with false conceptions and great peril to my soul to be here sculpting divine things. I'm not a poet, so I won't make an attempt at analyzing this poem, but it certainly seems that the sculpture was troubling him. It is one of the few pieces he made with, with no commission and fully for himself. As far as sculpture goes, even in its unfinished, destroyed, and then later restored state, it's a special piece. The four figures, each at a different height, brings the eye upwards to the head of the cloaked figure, believed to be Nicodemus, then from Nicodemus's shoulder down into Christ's right arm. Christ's hand is composed so our eyes are brought back into the sculpture again. If he posed the hand heading out into space, this effect would be lost and the sculpture overall less pleasing to look at. From there, our eye is led down to Mary Magdalene's arm into Christ's leg, before we travel up Christ's left arm to the climax of the sculpture, at least to me the Virgin Mary and Christ's head. The composition functions extremely well as a self-contained unit, which makes it very, very compact, easy to look at, and it's very hard to take your eyes away from the composition. The internals of the sculpture are extremely solid as far as structure goes also. Now this can be very hard to accomplish when the ribcage is twisting on top of the pelvis as it is here, but the ribcage and pelvis function extremely well as units, which is something I preach all the time in my other sculpture videos. Michelangelo is often thought of as the master of contorted poses, and while this is true, and this pose is contorted to a certain extent, Christ's pose is contorted to a certain extent, it is not overdone and pushed beyond the limits of believability. It's all very naturalistic, which I personally appreciate tremendously. When you talk people through these things, they sound so simple, so, so easy to do, so easy to think of, but this sort of stuff is not accomplished by accident, not at all. This is a composition done by an absolute master in full control of his craft. And he probably prepared himself extremely well in order to achieve all these things that I've just mentioned. A lot of people seem to be under the illusion 
that Michelangelo just magically made these things. I am of the mind that he was better prepared than anyone else, that he never settled for anything less than perfection, that he worked harder than everyone in order to design something beyond what had ever been done before. And that's why his work is so special. Or at least I'd like to believe it was this way. It's much more appealing, I think, to think of him in this light, as it makes him a lot more relatable and a lot more human. If you've watched other videos that I've made, you will likely have heard the mention of divine, divine topography before. And Michelangelo is more or less the originator of divine topography, and in this piece in particular, it's on display in full force. Pay close attention to the close-ups, especially the ones from the three-quarter views. You can see how full the forms are, how thick they are, how they come out from the other forms, how it's not all flat. The torso of Christ is a roaring ocean of forms. They are all extremely powerful as well. There are no small, delicate details, really. Everything here is full and volumetric. The reason I mention this is because so many people seem to believe that all the small, delicate and crispy details are important and what brings a piece to life. I think it's more about the arrangement of the larger forms, the sign of each shape and how the puzzle fits together in a three-dimensional way that creates intriguing figure sculpture. The body of Christ, I think, proves that such a theory is true, even if other ways might be true as well. There is close attention paid to the anatomy, but another interesting thing to note is that the anatomy is not very schematic. It's fully realistic and lifelike, which makes me think he must have worked from life if not on this particular piece, then at least for a very long time. And I believe there's evidence for this as well, so we know he worked from, from models and from life. Now, if he just dissected corpses and knew anatomy intimately, I don't think you can sculpt a Christ so lifelike and human without having worked from life. Perhaps it's the unfinished state of the sculpture that intrigues me, perhaps the composition, Probably all of it combined, I imagine. Subtle things that would pass over the heads of most are, are present here. Notice, for example, how from some views, the contour of Christ on our left is outlined by the drapery of the figure of Nicodemus. So the contour gets a very dark shape behind it, which in turn makes the contour extremely clear and visible. I don't, I don't believe this happens by accident. This is thought out. And, and it's, it's brilliant, it's magnificent and brilliant. To me, this is the single best sculpture ever made. And it's the best example of Michelangelo sculpting a body that is fully lifelike and real. The David is great. The Pietà in Rome is great. But none of them come particularly close to representing life in the same convincing fashion that this does. And it accomplishes something that all figurative sculptors should strive for, and that is to consider not making work only for the now, but consider making work for eternity. This is the burden of the sculptor, and you should always strive for it. We work in materials of stone and bronze, materials that are extremely durable and might last forever. and. Eternity is the burden of the sculptor, and you should always strive for making work that will last for eternity. Even though it's most likely eternity is not meant for all of us. My main takeaway when seeing pieces that move me like this is that they will always resonate. The concepts upon which pieces that resonate forever are based, those concepts are universal, and they are an intricate part of the human experience which hasn't changed that much in 500 years. We call them the old masters, not because they are old, but because they are masters. We call them the old bastards, because they set the bar high. 
and none higher than Michelangelo Bonarotti.